to talk to you about advocacy and how it can work in your favor. Later, you will have an opportunity to tell us what your issues are. On the other hand, you'll see that other people will have the same issue or issues as you do. This way, you can join forces with other people and form a group or a coalition. This can be very productive. We call this organizing. By organizing, you gain momentum on your issue. Uh, I, I, uh, I, uh, okay. uh, yeah. I know that we do a lot of organizing and progress. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> um, and he's saying by me being the community organizer that I do more organizing than anybody in the office, but we're a grassroots organization, so that wouldn't be possible without you guys. We're all in the same boat. Because of her, people are passionate about the same issue. This will help you advocate with a legislator. This is why we must get more active in the legislative process. And the only way that we can do that is to make our voices heard in the legislative process. We do that by voting. And I urge you to exercise that right to vote. How many people here today are registered voters? Show of hands. Good. Because we must become a bigger voting block to get the attention of legislators. Legislators will listen to us if they know we're going to vote. Or more importantly, if they know if we're going to vote for them. Last August 28th, we had a demonstration at the governor's office. About 80 people, Ralph Sammy Bolin Light in the state of Illinois, Bill King. And a couple of people that are here today was at that protest back in August. We had media coverage, too. Well, power to the people. Governor Quinn rescinded the budget cuts. And he also restored the funding for the personal assistance programs, etc. for independent living in the state. However, this is a new year. And we have to fight that battle all over again. It does seem that whenever we fight authority, authority always wins. Why is that? Why? Why? Does anybody have any idea why? It's because they are in position to do so. Like the governor or the president or, or state rep or federal representative or federal or state senator, they're in a position of power to do so. We must use it in a good and a productive way and fight authority. As you well know, for far too long in our society, 
people with disabilities have been disempowered by the system. I know I have at times in life. Well, you know, folks, it's time for us to stand up or sit up and say, we're not going to tolerate this nonsense any longer. There is truth when they say there is power in numbers. Maybe we don't have the money that the nursing home lobbyists do. But we've got people power. Yeah. You'd be amazed how a group of people in wheelchairs showing up at a legislator's office can be. The sight of people in wheelchairs looks much larger than the actual amount of people there are. Five people in wheelchairs can seem like ten people in wheelchairs. Ten people in wheelchairs can seem like twenty people in wheelchairs. Some power can be achieved by doing direct action. By direct action, I don't mean by handcuffing yourself to a bus or to your wheelchair. You can engage in direct action by simply writing letters to your legislators or to your city officials. Direct action is leafletting on the sidewalk to advocate mm -hmm. for a particular issue. We know that comfort levels vary among people. At adopt actions, we don't force people to get arrested like you have. or to block an intersection. We respect a person's decisions during protests. But the thing to remember is you're capable of being in control of and being in control of power. You, we're capable of being in control of that power, taking some of that power back. And that's very important to remember. Because we're just as important. Yeah. Because our issues are just as important as everybody else's issues. How many of you has ever heard of what happened? Um, How many of you have ever heard of an organization called ADAPT? Yeah. I'd like to give you a brief history of what happened. Chicago ADAPT was formed in 1984. We started to fight the injustice of the city of Chicago having no accessible public transportation for people with disabilities. Back then, we always packed the CTA boardroom to tell the board how unhappy we were at no accessible buses in the city. In the early 80s, Chicago Adapt and National Adapt took our spirits to the streets and fought for accessible public transportation. Some of us put our health on the line in jail to prove our point. Yeah, like over there. <laughs> like Mike Grice over there. <laughs> Raise your hand, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and we won. As the Americans with disabilities Act was passed in 1990. Chicago started to purchase more accessible buses. We often do civil disobedience. We successfully fought and advocated for accessible public transportation for people with disabilities. This issue is an example of a local issue as well as a national issue because back then Chicago didn't have any accessible public transit as well the rest of the country yeah. 
That's why it's a local and a national mm -hmm. issue. Starting in the 1990s, ODAPT has been advocating for home and community-based attendant services to keep people with disabilities living in the community than in nursing homes and institutions. <laughs> How many of you have lived or live in a nursing home? We'd all agree that that's not a nice place that, for people to live, right? Those of us that have lived there or have heard about them, we'd all agree that that's not a place to live. They're very oppressive. Chicago Act worked with Illinois Congressman Danny Davis to create a federal legislation which would enable people to move from nursing homes and institutions and back into the community. This legislation is called the Community Choice Act. House Bill 1621. This legislation was written by National Adapt to address the institutional bias in this country. This is a national issue. Before I close, I'd like to tell you why it's so important to vote. I thought that I'd share with you what Bob Kafka says. Bob Kafka is one of the national organizers of ADAPT. Bob talks about the disability vote. Like me, he's been arrested several times for civil disobedience. Bob says the following. I do a lot of organizing trainings for ADAPT a national grassroots disability rights organization. I learn a lot from the people that attend these trainings. Recently, I was in Mississippi, where a grandmother with a disability was telling me how she could not believe how people took for granted their right to vote. She told me how as a child she was part of the civil rights protests of the 60s and had gone to jail for that right to vote. Amazing. She and her children being thrown in jail. And we in the disability community that has never experienced anything close to that oppression. Complain it's too much trouble for us to vote. As the late Just and Dart said it well. Vote like your life depends on it, because it does. Let's heed Mr. Dart's suggestion, so that we, people with disabilities, can be a force to be reckoned with in the political and legislative process. Uh, uh, by by the way, I forgot to say that once a month, Chicago ADAPT has a meeting. And this meeting is on the first Wednesday of every month. And it's held from 5.30 to 7.30. And it's held at 115 West Chicago Avenue. It's in Chicago and the building it's held at is called Access Living.
Chicago. And Access Living is the Center for Independent Living that covers the city of Chicago. <laughs> and we need new people <laughs> to fight the good fight. <laughs> So give me a call and we can talk more about it if you want to become a member of Chicago or that. Hello, my name is Horacio Sparza, and I'm here to invite you to listen to our radio show, Independent Living, every Saturday from 9 a.m. to 10 in English and from 10 to noon in Spanish. Please tune WNTD 950 a.m. Remember, every Saturday, 9 a.m. to 10 in English, 10 to noon in Spanish. We present stories, we interview leaders, legislators, and much, much more. Morning Chicago, I'm Chris Vaughn with Adapt Chicago Productions. I'm here at Triton College with the director of the CAST program, Deborah M. Huck Fork. As the director, what do you do here at Triton? Uh, my job as the director is to oversee this entire program, to make sure that all of the services are in place, that each student is provided with uh, correct accommodations according to their particular needs. So students' um, services are set up individually. Each student receives the services that they need so they can be successful in their academic goal. Um, and then that leads to their career. So I uh, make sure that everything is in place. Uh, we have enough staff to help these students. Um, and then they're trained on how these services are used. And we also have volunteers that I oversee and train. So first of all, when a student comes in, they apply for services. They fill out our um, data form, which is general information, and that's where they're um, requesting the services they think that they need. Um, we then receive documentation from them. It might be medical records, it might be a psychological report from their high school, it might be from their psychologist. Um, but they supply us with that, and we look at their request, and then we look at what their documentation reads and we can then see what services they really do need. Sometimes students don't even know about some of the things we have to provide, so they're not even looking or knowing to ask for it. So we take a look and sometimes offer extra services that they haven't thought to ask for. So a student might come in and we may see that they have the need for um, a note-taking service um, or a testing accommodation. And the testing accommodations really are quite a few different kinds of things. They might need a distraction-free room to take their test in. Or they may need extra time while they're taking the test. Some students need the test read to them. And we have software that they can actually scan the test, comes on the computer for them to see it, and then it reads it to them aloud. Now, students who have difficulty writing or using their hands efficiently, we also have that software where we can use the mouse to circle the answers on the screen. And then we can print that test and send it back to the teacher. So there's a, an array of things a student might need if they need testing accommodations. But we can handle any of that depending on what the need is. What type of services do you guys provide if someone cannot type at all or write at all? We have a special software on a computer that um, is called iGaze. The way that software works is the student actually controls the whole computer with their eyes. So the camera on the computer sees their eyes. They have a, um, an account just for themselves and the computer knows it's them when they get on. And as they move their eyes across the screen, that moves the mouse. When they blink, it makes the mouse click. So they can actually come in and do a test 
or their whole paper using the eye gaze to control the computer to do what they need to do just like anyone else. And students like to be in independent. They want to be able to do their own things. So it's all about us providing things to help students be independent and do all of the things anyone else can do. Because once they leave here, they need to prov you know, prove to an employer that they're capable of doing that job. Again, say you can't type or write, but you need to write a paper. Mm -hmm. Do you have programs that will help them actually write the paper? The program um, called JAWS is a screen reading program and we use that in conjunction with um, naturally speaking. So as a student speaks, it'll print the words right up on the screen and then they can see what they put up there. And it can also read it back to them. So Zoom Text will enlarge it, JAWS will take what you say, put it on the screen, and if you want it read back to you, you can ask that. Or you can enlarge it and see. So it's, we have students with visual difficulties, mm -hmm. and it can make it as large as they need it so they can see what they've said to put up there. But the whole computer is controlled by their voice. So they get to know the, the program, and the program has to get to know them. Because every one of us speak differently, we pronounce words differently, and the computer has to get to know that program, each of us. And when our account comes up, it will type what we're, we have to say. In case of emergencies, what programs or services do you have set up for um, safety? Well, first of all, as the students come in, we, we look for that and we ask and evaluate whether the student's going to be needing assistance exiting a building during any kind of evacuation. And so we speak with the students to see if that's something they're going to need. And if they do, and if, even if the, you know, they just want it, just to be sure that they feel safe, we set them up in our database so that if there was any reason to evacuate a building, then um, their name pops up. So we have a crisis management team on the campus. And what they've done is they've set up building managers for every building. So every building on the campus has been assigned two to three building managers. They have a list, they get an updated list twice a semester of students who have requested or have the need for assistance evacuating a building. So if for any reason the building need to be evacuated, those building managers have those students' names on the list and it tells them what days and times the students in their building and where they're located. The teacher is also notified that that particular student will need assistance exiting the building in case there was an evacuation. So the teacher is aware, as well as the safety uh, managers of the building. And once there is an, ev an evacuation, the building managers are there to help the EMS team and the police. So that way students feel very safe. Now sometimes when students register for a class, they might register for a class that's located on a third floor of a building or a second floor of a building. The buildings that are all stand alone, if there's a class on the second floor, we relocate their class for them. We just do that as standard procedure because if they're on the second floor, if the electricity was to go out, the elevators no longer work. And we don't want a student not to be able to get out or make it difficult to help them leave the building. Right. So we just do the room re uh, relocation. It's just something we do every semester. Um, the students remind us or tell us when they've registered or we also check on them to be sure we don't have anyone like that. Now if we have a student in some of our buildings that have a second floor walkway from building to building, students may be on the first or second floor in those buildings because there is a walkway to the next building where electricity should be on and they can then exit using the elevators. Um, so we remove them from the third floor. We just do a room change and the whole class just meets in another room. So we are very cognizant of the needs of students being in a safe area and having assistance nearby. So this way we have make sure that the student's teacher is aware as well as the building managers in our police department. What other um, types of services are there for the campus in general to be accessible? Well, accessibility has many meanings. So it's accessibility, people always think of getting in and out of buildings. Now we have 
push buttons for the doors and that just opens the doors and we have the elevators that take students up and down um, but we also you know have access to classes and people don't always think of that access to classes well that may mean that you need a service in the classroom someone to take notes for you or you might need to bring your personal care attendant with you to school or you may have a service animal that you need to bring with you and that's also in the eyes of access you know having access to the buildings to the classes to instruction as well we also for our students who are low vision and blind we have a mobility training so when they come to our campus I'll actually take them and train them on how to find their way around the campus using their cane and that way they again can be independent they may need someone the first few times to go with them until they feel they really know the route but we do that training on campus to make sure they're comfortable because they don't want to come the first day of school and not be able to find where to go and we have braille room numbers um, within the buildings too so if they want to make sure they've arrived at the right room they can touch the you know numbers on the wall and know that this is the correct room because students have said to me I don't want to be sitting in the room and then find out I'm in the wrong class how <laughs> embarrassing that could be right, right. so we make sure that you know, they don't find themselves in a math class when they should be in sociology or something. All right. I know that feeling. Yeah, yeah another one of our services is where we uh, provide tutoring for students throughout the campus. And students may uh, work with a tutor to better understand the material for their class and do better in classes. Um, the tutor will explain concepts so they can then go home, do their homework, um, prepare for the next exam. Um, students also work in study groups and we encourage students to form study groups with other students in their classes so they can better understand the material by working together and many times um, that's also helpful along with the tutoring service that Triton College has to offer. If you have any more questions please go to www.triton.edu backslash Cast that is C A A S. Closed captioning made possible by support from the Costa Sea Foundation.